Thank you, Alan. We're continuing in Galatians. We're reading in Galatians chapter 2. Sandy started this chapter last week. It was great. Uh, sorry. Joshua started last week in uh, Galatians chapter 2. And uh, I'll complete this chapter, I hope. Um, let's read, please, Galatians chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 13, uh, thir verse 11. I don't know if I'm going to have trouble with my notes today. Right, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Heavenly Father, we just commit this message from your word to you. Speak to us, Lord, and help us to understand it. In Christ's name, amen. So, right. Right, I think I'm on. Um, just a little bit of background as we come into this uh, section here. Peter's was a, Peter was a devout Jew. Now our reading started said when Cephas came to Antioch. Now Cephas is another name for Peter. Uh, Peter was a devout Jew. He was raised with the typical Jewish traditions. He understood circumcision. It's about keeping the law. Even the Gentiles were heathens and they were not to be associated with. It was all Jewish traditions. But Christ began a work in Peter. Back in Matthew chapter 15, they were having, Jesus was having a discussion about washing of hands. And uh, he said to Peter, and it, he said uh, to Peter, whatever enters the mouth, does not defile you, but what comes out of the mouth is what defiles you. Peter, God was starting to break down some of Peter's old traditions. And then God continues this work on Peter in Acts chapter 10, where God calls Peter to take the gospel message to Cornelius and his household. God gives Peter a vision, the sheet coming down, loaded up with food, lovely food. It's food that Jews don't eat. It's unclean. And Peter says, no, I won't eat it. And geez, God did that three times. And then he lifted the sheet up. And then Cornelius called on him. In Acts uh, 10, 15, uh, first of all, God says, do not call unclean what I have declared to be clean. And then Cornelius comes and uh, Peter realized that God is giving him a message. 
Peter has realized that God is saying the Gentiles have the law have, are acceptable to God as well. And so in um, chapter 10, verse 34, Peter acknowledged that God does not show favoritism. Jews and Gentiles are equally acceptable to God. And in verse 45 of chapter 10, the Jews were astonished that the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit just as the Jews did at Pentecost. God was not a respecter of persons. And of course, when they believed, they were baptized. They weren't circumcised. And I want you to remember that because that's a part of this Judaism thing that they're talking about, uh, circumcision. But um, they were baptized and not circumcised. Then in Acts chapter 15, we hear about or we read about the church conference to discuss whether the Gentiles were acceptable in the church and how they should be accepted. And of course, they all got up and had their say. Peter was a keynote speaker and said, they have received the Holy Spirit just as we have received the Holy Spirit. And so they were accepted on the basis that they were saved by the grace of God alone. And that they did not need to be circumcised. They did not need to follow the Jewish laws. They were saved. And uh, now we get over to Galatians and... Uh, Peter has distanced himself. There's a problem. He's, he's been sitting down. He's been quite, quite okay. Sit down and eat, eat with the Gentiles. And some visitors come. Some visitors from Jerusalem. Some visitors who come and say, hey, you're a Jew. They're Gentiles. Why are you getting together? And they started pushing the Jew, Jewish way. With, uh, they've been called Judaizers. They're Christians, Jewish Christians, but they still hold to their old Jewish traditions. And Peter withdrew from the Gentiles and separated from them. And that was not on as far as Paul was concerned. And so, um, and Peter, when he was withdrawing from the Gentiles, he was saying that the Jews and Gentiles are different. But uh, in fact, he's saying, well, the Jews are better than the Gentiles. He was acting out of fear of these visitors who came and they were legalists. They were holding these legal traditions. So Paul challenged Peter about his behavior. He challenged them about in front of the whole church. He said that the whole church was there and Paul challenged Peter. He said, why are you doing this? You could eat with the Gentiles a week ago. This week, you're not eating with them. Why? Peter's sin was a public sin. He did it in front of him. Everyone knew what, he, what Peter had done. And so Paul rebuked him in public. There are three tragic results from Peter's um, actions. First of all, it made him a hypocrite. Peter was pretending that his actions were built up on religious grounds, on the laws of Moses. He's using the scriptures to say, well, I shouldn't be associating with them. He's using Bible doctrine to account for his disobedience. He was a hypocrite. He was only a week or two before that. He was sitting down, he's having fellowship with the Gentiles and enjoying their fellowship. The second thing is, Peter led others astray. When he started that action, when he separated other Christians, other Jewish Christians, they separated, and soon we had, a, he led others astray. And we read there that even Barnabas, a pillar of the church, was led astray. He was drawn out and separated from, just as the other uh, Jewish Christians were. The third tragic result was that by doing this he was actually putting a division in the church so gentiles over there jews over there and that was it is causing disunity so our actions can uh, affect other people but paul's challenge to the legalistic jews 
was not on the basis of their personalities. It wasn't on the basis of their, that they were Jews or uh, that uh, he used doctrine. Paul says that he, he was challenging them on the question of the truth of the gospel. Do you get that in verse 14? He said, you have denied the truth of the gospel. And uh, this verse comes up back in verse 5. In, uh, I think I might have that on the slide. Um, can't read anyway he he challenged them on the truth of the gospel and that first comes up in chapter 2 verse 5 where it uh, reads that um, we did not give into them this is into the judaizers so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you the, the truth of the gospel was preeminent in paul's mind and so it wasn't the confrontation that we're looking at here, even though that's that takes the lead, but it's not the confrontation we're looking at. We're looking today at maintaining the truth of the gospel. And um, we need to be aware that our actions can complicate the gospel for others. And people can be actually turned away from the gospel by our actions. Then we get um Paul's rebuke. Some Bible students, uh, the word is sort of far, far more qualified than I am, but it can't quite determine where Paul's rebuke of Peter and his letter to the Galatians sort of start and finish. So I'm going to assume that this whole the rest of this chapter is all Paul's rebuke. And it's all, it's all the same. It's all about the same message. It's all got the, got the same, uh, act, same point about the truth of the gospel. And so um, I want to look at that. And um, the truth of the gospel is being affected by the actions of these legalists. And there are five basic Christian doctrines that we're going to look at that were being denied by Peter because of his separation with the from the Gentiles. The first one is going back to the law, broke down the unity of the church. Peter was a Jew. But through, through his faith in Christ, he had become a Christian. And because he was a Christian, he was a part of the church. And in the church, there was no racial discrimination, no racial distinctions. We're going to read in another, maybe next week or the week after, in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, male or female. There's no distinctions in God's church. But Peter was making a distinction. And we've already seen how the Lord has been working in Peter, taught him about Cornelius, taught him about the Jerusalem conference, and he was changing Peter. But Paul's words must have really struck a chord with Peter when he said, you are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile. Now you want the Gentiles to live like Jews. What sort of inconsistency is this? You're a hypocrite, Peter. Peter himself had stated at the Jerusalem conference that God had put no distinction between Jew or Gentile. But now was putting Peter was putting a difference there. God's people are one people. Even though they may be in various groups or different nationalities, we're all one people. We can go any country and we'll find brothers and sisters in the Lord and we can have fellowship with them. Anything we do that causes separation from one brother from another is a denial of the unity of the body of Christ. The second thing that is happening, going back to the law, denied justification by faith alone. Now, this is an important uh, point here because this is the first mention of justification in uh, Galatians, and we're going to get a lot more. But um, 
some people or my scholars believe that Galatians was probably the first book of the New Testament that was written. Now, if that's the case, this is the first mention of justification in the New Testament. And always, if you look at the first mention, it is always good to look at that in more detail. So I will look at that in more detail. And uh, just before I do, justification by faith was the watchword of the Reformation. And it's important that we understand this doctrine. And um, so I'm just going to, just want you to remember those two points because we're going to come back and finish that slide with the other four, three points. But um, I'm going to go to have a look at justification. In Job chapter 9, verse 2, Job asked this final question. How should a man be just with God? How can a man possibly be just with God? We're sinners. How can we be just? And the answer, it gives us eternal consequences. We've got to be right or just with God before we can be with him, be in heaven. Habakkuk 2.4 gives us the answer. The just shall live by his faith. And it was this truth that liberated Martin Luther from the religious bondage and fear. So important is this preset concept that three New Testament books, it takes three books to explain it. You get in Romans, chapter, key verse says 117, explains what the just, what it means to be just. In Galatians, and we're we'll looking at this probably next week in 311, explains shall live. How, how do we live? And Hebrews chapter 10, 38 and chapter 11, of course, explains by faith. The just shall live by faith. Mr. Vine says this about justification. He says, to, to deem right, to show to be right or righteous or to declare to be righteous. Ideally, the complete fulfillment of the law of God would be uh, would provide a basis for justification. If we could totally obey the law, we could be justified. But no one has ever totally obeyed the law. The Lord Jesus Christ accepted, but he took our sins on him. But the only way you could be just is to totally obey the law, and we can't do that. It says there in uh, Romans 2.13, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. But no one has ever been able to do that. And uh, so we've got, no, no one is righteous, not one. Mr. Vine goes on and says, justification is the legal and formal acquittal from guilt by God as judge. He pronounces the sinner as righteous who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's Mr. Vine. Warren Worsby says this, justification is the act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous in Jesus Christ. Now, every word of that statement is very, I haven't got it up there. Right. Every word of that uh, statement is important. He says, Justification is an act. It's not a process. There's no Christian is more justified than another. You're either you're justified or you're not. In Romans 5, 1, we read that having therefore been once for all justified by faith, we have peace with God. Once for all justified. Since we are justified by faith, it is in an instant. It's an immediate transaction between the sinner and God. If we were justified by works, it would be a gradual thing. We had to do more and more works to get better and better, but that doesn't work. It was an instant thing. So we're justified by the act, and it is the act of God. It's not the result of man's character or works. In Romans 8.33, we read, it is God that justifies. So it is God who does this work. It is not by doing the works of the law that the sinner gets the right standing before God. 
because it's impossible to please God that way. We are justified by putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul will explain later in this letter, the law was given to reveal sin, not to redeem from sin. And in, um, God, in his grace, has put our sins on Christ. And Christ's righteousness has been put to our account. Christ was sinless, but he's taken our sin and he's given us his righteousness. Uh, 2 Corinthians. 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. When we become the righteousness of God, we're justified. In justification, God declares the believing sinner righteous. He does not make that sinner righteous. He declares him to be righteous. And uh, but real justification will see a real change in life. So when we have a change in life, we will then want to do God's works. And uh, James chapter 2 was all about that. We're, our life will be changed and we'll be doing the works of God. Not to get salvation, but because we are saved. So that before the sinner trusts Christ, he is guilty before God. But the moment he trusts Christ, he is declared not guilty and he can never be called guilty again. Justification is not just being forgiven. Now, a person can be forgiven and turn around and sin again. And what happens? They've got to be forgiven again. Once you have been justified by faith, we can be, never be guilty before God. I heard of a godly man who was counselling a young man who was caught up in sin. And this godly man says, just confess it to God and he'll forgive you. And next week, the same thing. Just confess it to God and he'll forgive you. Just confess it to God and he'll forgive you. It doesn't work that way. There has to be repentance. And uh, without repentance, we've got to, got to get that order. Repentance, confession, and then forgiveness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book on discipleship, calls this cheap grace. He defines cheap grace as a preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. He says it's baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Absolution without confession. He says, cheap grace is grace without discipline. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Cheap grace. And so often we try to sell cheap grace. There is a standard. God's got his standard. We have to have repentance first. Now, justification is not just the pardon either. Because a pardoned person, criminal, still has a record. He is only pardoned from the legal penalty of his crime. And um, Romans 4, we read that when a sinner is justified by faith, his past sins are remembered no more. And go, God no longer holds his sins on record. So, I hope that helps a little bit on justification but we'll look a bit more um, God justifies sinners not good people Paul declares that God justifies the ungodly Romans 4 and 5 says this however to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked his faith is credited as righteousness the reason most sinners are not justified because they will not admit that they are sinners. The sinners are the only kind of people Jesus Christ came to save. And he tells us that in the Gospels. Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, that came to save sinners. When Peter separated himself from the Gentiles, 
who was denying the truth of justification by faith because he was saying, we Jews are different from you Gentiles. In fact, we're better. Yet both Jews and Gentiles are, are sinners. They are both sinners. They're in the same boat. In Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. Not just Jews and Gentiles, we all have sinned. And we all can only be saved by faith in Christ. Now we go back to that slide with the... Uh, Peter's actions have affected the church. Going back to the law denied that we are free from the law. And uh, verse 17 and 18, I'll just read them. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Paul's argument goes like this. Peter, you and I did not find salvation through the law. We found it through faith in Christ. But now after being saved, you go back to the law. This means that you're saying your salvation is through Christ plus the law. That's wrong. You do not have to add the law for salvation. Furthermore, Peter, you have preached the gospel of God's grace to Jews and you've preached it to the Gentiles and you've told them the same thing. You're saved by faith and not by keeping the law. But by going back into the legalism of the law, you are building up what you'd pull down. This means that you actually sin by tearing it down in the first place. It's a complicated argument. But we can be caught up in legalism. In other words, Paul is saying here, from Peter's own experience of the grace of God, he says to go back to the law is to deny everything that God had done for him and through him. We look at the next thing that uh, Peter's actions done. Going back to the law denies the gospel itself. Verses 19 and 20. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If a man is justified by works of the law, then why did Christ have to die? His death, burial and resurrection are the key truths of the gospel as shared by Peter. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, we read that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the 12. Peter was among the first to actually see the risen Lord. And when Peter went back to the law, he was denying the truth of the gospel. We are saved by faith in Christ alone. We live by faith in Christ. Furthermore, we are identified with Christ by the Spirit because we have died with him. This means that we are dead to the law. So to go back to Moses and the law is to return, as it were, to the graveyard. It's dead. Romans 6, 4 was held that we have been raised to walk in newness of life. And since we live by his resurrection power, we do not need the help of the law. In Galatians 2, 20, in our reading we had, I have been crucified with Christ. The Christian's hope and joy is our union with Jesus Christ. We share in his death. Therefore, the bonds of sin are broken. We share in his resurrection and therefore receive power for a new life. It is Christ living in me that is the secret of spiritual life. Not any attempts of mine to keep the law given to a different race in a different age. Jesus, not the law, must remain the sole center of our lives. 
He is the key to our personal relationship with God. Jesus Christ alone. The fifth thing that happened, and um, Peter separated from the uh, Gentiles, he says, going back to the law, denied the grace of God. In verse 21, it says, do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Judaizers wanted to mix law and grace, but Paul tells us that's impossible. To go back to the law means to set aside the grace of God. Peter had experienced God's grace in his own salvation. He had proclaimed God's grace in his own ministry. But when he withdrew from the Christ, Gentile Christian fellowship, he openly denied the grace of God. Grace says there is no difference. All are sinners, all could be saved through faith in Christ. But Peter's actions said there is a difference. The grace of God is not sufficient. We also need the law to be grace plus the law. So to return to the law cancels out the cross. If righteousness came by the law, Christ died in vain. The law says you've got to do it. Grace says it's done. It is finished was Christ's victorious cry. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith and not by works. We have no record of Peter's reply to Paul's rebuke. But scripture would indicate that Peter certainly agreed with Paul. He, his fellowship with Paul was restored, the fellowship with the church was restored. Because if we read in first uh, and second Peter, the books that or letters that Peter wrote, it's full of grace. The, the first, first letter in particular, every chapter talks about grace. And uh, so he is in full support and uh, with Paul and with the church. So Peter has been restored. That ends our exciting drama of this conflict. But there's one more thing we can learn from this drama and that involves you and me that involves what we what is our response we know what peter's response was when the uh, when he was challenged it was fear and failure we know what paul's response was when he saw the truth of the gospel being diluted it was a courage and defense but the important question is what is my response to the truth of the gospel? We can ask ourselves some, a few questions. Have I been saved by the grace of God? Am I trusting in myself for salvation, in my own morality, in, in my own good works, or even in my religion, coming to church every Sunday? Am I trusting that? That's not going to get us anywhere. If we're trusting in those, those things, we're not a Christian. A true Christian is one who has trusted Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The only gospel that saves is the gospel of the grace of God, as revealed in Jesus Christ. Any other gospel is a false gospel and is condemned. And that's mentioned in Galatians 1, 9 as another gospel. Another question we can ask ourselves, am I trying to mix law and grace? Law means I must do something to please God, while grace means that God has finished the work for me and all I need to do is believe on Christ. Salvation is not by faith in Christ plus something. It is by faith in Christ alone. While church membership and religious activities are good in their place as expressions of faith in Christ, they can never be added to faith in Christ in order to secure eternal life. Romans 11.6 says this, And if by grace, then it is no more of works, 
Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So our works will not help us to get to heaven. James 2 tells us that our faith is declared by the works we do. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're, we're justified, and then we have a changed life and our actions show where we're at. And another question we can ask ourselves, am I rejoicing in the fact that I am justified by faith in Christ? It's often said that justified means just as if I'd never sinned. And that's correct. It brings great peace to the heart to know that one has a right standing before God. Just think the righteousness of Christ has been put on our account. The Christ's righteousness is put to us. He's taken our sins. God has only declared that we are righteous in Christ. But he deals with us through though we had never sinned at all. We need never fear judgment because our sins have already been judged in Christ. Romans 8 and 1. God justifies us. He declares us righteous. But there are some consequences. There's consequences for our sin. We may be forgiven, but the scars of our sin are still evident. Now, to think of an example, a prisoner in prison, Bryson talking to him with these notes, and he accepts the Lord Jesus Christ. He's forgiven. He's justified. But he still has to stay in prison and serve his sentence. There's the consequences for his sin. He still has to take out the, uh, the consequences of his sin but he's justified he's still right before god another question am i walking in the liberty of grace liberty does not mean license rather it means the freedom in christ to enjoy him to become what he has determined for us to become it is not only freedom to do, but freedom not to do. We are no longer in bondage to sin and the law. As Paul will explain in the practical sections of this letter in chapters 5 and 6. We obey God because of love, not because of the law. Christians enjoy a wonderful liberty in Christ. Am I enjoying it? Are you? Another question. Am I willing to defend the truth of the gospel? This does not mean that we become evangelical detectives going around and checking out the beliefs of every church and every Bible class around the place. Look at what we're doing. Look at what you're doing. It means that we should not fear men who come in with false teaching because we know that we can uphold the truth of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Many people we come in contact with believe that people are saved by faith in Christ plus doing good works or plus keeping the Ten Commandments or plus obeying the Sermon on the Mount and many other numerous religious pluses. We may not have the same apostolic authority that Paul had, but we do have the Word of God to proclaim. And it is our obligation to share that truth. Last question. Am I walking upright according to the truth of the gospel? The best way to defend the truth is to live the truth. My verbal defense means nothing if my life says something else. Our life and our words must balance. Paul is going to explain to us how to live in liberty by the grace of God in the coming chapters. And it is important that we obey what he says. A new employee just started his job 
and the boss has given him instructions. He says, now your job is to check that these valves that are coming through here are the right size. If they're too big, they won't fit the, fit the machine. If they're too small, they'll leak. They've got to be the right size. So you got a micrometer. He sets it. He said, that's the size it's got to be. Been on the job for two or three hours. And uh, the foreman in the assembly area comes back and says, what's going on up there? He says, these valves don't fit. So the foreman goes down, says to this guy, says, what's, what's, what's happening here? He says, well, most of the valves are coming through are too tight. So I just open the micrometer a little bit and they all fit. Now, changing our standards will never make for success. Not in the assembly line, not in church. We don't change our standards to suit what is coming through. We keep God's standard as standard. We keep the truth of the gospel as the truth of the gospel. And when we do that, we'll stay right. We'll be like Paul. And just a, one closing comment. David Jeremiah this morning said this. This is the truth. We will not move away from it. That's where we should be. We've got to stay with the truth of the gospel and don't move away from it. God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can be encouraged by it. Lord, that we can learn from it and learn from the examples of men like Paul and Peter and Barnabas. Lord, help us to take this, your word, and to apply it to our lives today. In Christ's name, amen.